Welcome back to the Ninja Nerd Podcast. Today we're talking about cystic kidney disease. Ooh, wee! You know we like that. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to apologize for the behavior of my passion, okay? I'm a little <laughs> excited today. So, cystic kidney disease. Let's, <laughs> let's get into it. We have one case to talk about. Pretty straightforward, but let's see if you guys can crack it. So, we have a 30-year-old man presents to the clinic with complaints of flank pain, hematuria, and a palpable abdominal mass. His HPI, the patient reports experiencing intermittent dull, aching pain in his right flank for the past two months. The pain has gradually worsened and is now constant, sometimes becoming sharp. He also notes episodes of gross hematuria over the past few weeks, which prompted him to seek medical attention. He denies any fever, chills, dysuria, or recent trauma. Additionally, he mentions noticing a fullness in his abdomen, particularly on the right side. Don't I always know? I'm always feeling a little... A little full. Yeah, us, us big boys were, <laughs> yeah. were we're constantly full. Well, actually, the problem is is that we're never we're never full. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I got an acidic abdomen. All right. <laughs> the patient also reports a history of frequent urinary tract infections and nephrolithiasis over the past several years. His mother had an intracranial aneurysm that ruptured, leading to her death oh. at age fifty. Sad. That is unfortunate. Past medical history: hypertension, frequent nephrolithiasis, and frequent UTIs. Family history, father died of kidney failure at age 55, mother had an intracranial aneurysm and hypertension, died at age 50. For the exam, vitals, BP 160 over 95, heart rate is 82, respiration 16, and his temp is 98.2. Well appearing male, in mild discomfort due to flank pain, regular rate and rhythm, no murmurs, normal heart sounds, uh, respiratory, he is clear to auscultation bilaterally. Abdominal, there's right flank tenderness, palpable mass in the right abdomen, which is firm and non-tender. There is no rebound or guarding. What could that be all about? Oh, he's got something brewing in there. I don't know what it may it's be. It's not good. No, he's got some kind of like tumor hanging out the side of his, his kidney. It seems really? Like. No, I don't know. It just, okay. it's, it's, there's a big old mass there of yeah, some so, sort. Something's not right. Something's brewing. Genitourinary, there is no costovertebral angle <clears throat> tenderness. Neuro, alert and oriented, no focal deficits. In skin, there's no rashes or bruising. We get some lab findings. We get a creatinine, which is 2.0. BUN is 50. GFR is 38. Hemoglobin is 13.2. Potassium is 4.8. Sodium, 140. We order a, a urinalysis. We get the following findings back. Gross hematuria. 10 to 15 red blood cells per high power field. That ain't good. <laughs> no. You should have what? Maybe a couple? Like nothing. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to see it. Yeah, anything. yeah. You shouldn't really have any microscopic hematuria, but this person's got some, some good amounts. Yeah. We have a one plus protein urea, and there are no casts. Imaging findings, we do a couple different imaging. We have a, a renal ultrasound, which is showing bilaterally enlarged kidneys with multiple cysts of varying sizes throughout the renal parenchyma. Okay. All right. I could have just waited for all my questions because that just <laughs> said it right yeah, there exactly yeah that, yeah. that yep, gave yep, us yep. everything we needed right there yeah uh we do have hepatic and pancreatic cysts present all right, that, that's helpful as well all right so zach based on the above information let's review some important concepts first and foremost what's the diagnosis uh, based upon the ultrasound um they have the bilaterally enlarged kidneys with some you know pretty good sized cysts um Throughout both, you know, the kidneys, that's definitely su suggestive of polycystic kidney disease. Given the age, um, usually infantile, so autosomal recessive uh, presents more in the infants, young children. This patient is 30 years old, so this seems like it's more autosomal dominant, which is about the age range that they usually start to present 30s, 40s. They start to have some complications associated with the disease, but I definitely think that that's the likely cause. Um, there's a lot of features that make me suggest that. Um, obviously the first thing is the ultrasound findings. The second thing is the classic findings, which is usually flank pain. Um, and that's usually because they have all these cysts. They're super decent size. They're distending the renal capsule. Sometimes they can even rupture and that can cause some tenderness and pain as well. Um, so that's one sign. Hematuria is super common. That's because when those cysts rupture, they can cause bleeding into the collecting system. That's a pretty common one as well. And then hypertension. That's another very common and polycystic kidney disease. So that flank pain, that hematuria, the hypertension, a family history of kidney disease at a young age. And then the last one, and we can talk about that as we get further here, 
uh, a family history of a young one, uh, a young mother dying from an aneurysm, an intracranial aneurysm. Yeah. These patients are usually predisposed to intracranial aneurysms. Mm. So we should be very concerned about that right yeah, now. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So with the diagnosis of autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, what complications should we be concerned for? And I think we kind of just hinted to that with the exactly. intracranial um, aneurysm. Yeah, that's the big one, right? So one I would say is uh, end-stage renal disease. That's usually the biggest complication that we got to be very, very careful of um, because the cysts, as they continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger, they start compressing on nearby things. They compress on the renal vasculature. So imagine here I have one nephron. Here's I have another nephron. The vasculature going to one nephron is being compressed by a cyst from another nephron, and that reduces blood flow. So over time, they start to reduce their glomerular filtration rate. They start to develop ischemia to their nephrons, and they, they start dying. And so uh, I get worried about progression of their renal disease. So um, CKD, I have a GFR here of about 38. So they're definitely exhibiting some degree of CKD, especially with it up in the creatinine, up in the BUN. So definitely a, a CKD3 here at this point. So that's one big thing. I get really worried about them progressing to end-stage renal disease, developing uremia and complications associated with that. Uh, second one I get worried about is hypertension. Because they have that vasculature and it's compressing those renal vessels, it reduces the blood flow and activates the renin-angiotensin aldosterone system. They can get pretty good BPs. So they can be a very common cause of a young patient developing secondary hypertension. So you have a 30-year-old come in with high blood pressure or 20-something-year-old, that's not normal. It shouldn't be that way. And so if I have something like that or that I have on multiple antihypertensives, get a, a renal ultrasound. Make sure they don't have anything weird going on because polycystic kidney disease can cause that. And wouldn't that, if they had that, that wouldn't respond to antihypertensives? They don't respond as well. If they do, the best one to put them on is something to inhibit that RAS system. So putting them on thiazides, putting them on calcium channel blockers, those are okay. Uh, but the one that they're going to get the most bang for their buck and then a protective benefit from the kidney disease would be ACE inhibitors and ARBs. And if they you didn't do that, would it still be refractory? They could be. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the times you can start them on some of the essential hypertensive agents um, and they still may require a couple of these antihypertensives. Um, the other thing that I would get worried about with this patient is they do have frequent incidents of these cysts. They can be like little stasis pockets. And so sometimes you can form kidney stones. So I look for a history of frequent nephrolithiasis. Um, I'd look for uh, uh, urinary tract infections. Pyelonephritis is a pretty common one as well. Uh, but the big thing I would be careful of is the intracranial aneurysms. So these patients can form, uh, essentially, they have connective tissue defects. And so the connective tissue defects that they can experience tends to occur in a couple of different areas. One is it can occur in the mitral valve. One, it can occur in the, divertic uh, in the sigmoid colon and cause diverticulosis. Mitral valve can cause mitral valve prolapse. But the scary one that we get is the connective tissue in the uh, circle of Willis. So those arteries can start to balloon out and they can form an aneurysm. And if that ruptures, they can develop a subarachnoid hemorrhage and die. And so that's a really, really important one to remember. So I'd watch out for end-stage renal disease is a big complication. This one's already starting to show evidence. Hypertension, this patient has hypertension. And then uh, third is I'd watch out for any family history of intracranial aneurysms or any symptoms that would suggest that they ruptured and intracranial aneurysm. Those would be the big ones that I'd watch out for. So you mentioned before about age kind of separating your autosomal dominant from your recessive. Yeah. Can you discuss like just the differences between the two? What else besides age can you kind of differ? That's a good question. So obviously age is one, but other things that kind of comes into play here, and this is why that ultrasound was helpful, uh, hepatic and uh, pancreatic cysts or extra renal cysts, that can occur primarily in autosomal dominant. Usually in autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease, these patients can have what's called congenital hepatic fibrosis. They can develop portal hypertension. So they can literally start showing signs of like esophageal varices. They can have ascites. So they can, you know, they can have a big old belly. Yeah. Um, they can even have on top of that uh, any other features of portal hypertension. And so that's something I would get a little bit more concerned about and make me think about autosomal recessive. The other thing with autosomal recessive that we don't see in the dominant phase is that when these little children, these little babies, when they're in utero, they go into, they develop renal failure. They make their amniotic fluid from their urine. And so as they're developing, if their kidneys fail, they don't make urine. If they don't make urine, they don't make amniotic fluid. If they don't make amniotic fluid, then the actual amount of amniotic fluid decreases. They develop what's called oligohydramnios, and that starts squeezing the baby. And essentially, they develop all these like skeletal defects. So they can develop what's called um, craniofacial abnormalities. Yeah. They can develop like club feet. Um, but the worst case scenario is that it doesn't allow for the lungs to develop properly. So right. they develop tiny little lungs called pulmonary hypoplasia. 
and that increases their risk of developing respiratory distress when they're born. So those are the big things is infancy. But I'd say the second thing is just watching out for other two complications, which is um, portal hypertension due to congenital hepatic fibrosis. And second, really be watching out for respiratory distress, especially during the birth process. I've heard of another one being complex renal cysts. How do you differentiate complex renal cysts from polycystic kidney disease? Yeah, so that's a good question. So a lot of times people, like for example, me and you, let's say that we go to the hospital, we get a, a CT for something else. Maybe we have abdominal pain. It's something not even related to our kidneys. When we get that, sometimes you can find people who have incidental renal cysts, like simple ones, like little small, little circular, thin, smooth, well-rounded. They appear like they're dark in the center. Those are called simple renal cysts. What is more concerning is when you see cysts that are irregular. So they're not nice and clean circles. They're kind of like irregularly shaped. They don't have a very thin wall. They have a thick wall. They have septa. So they have like connective tissue that are things that are kind of diving into it. And it looks like it has different colors inside of it. That's a complex renal cyst. The biggest thing for those is you'll be able to differentiate those. Usually complex renal cysts are very concerning for malignancy. Mm -hmm. You can have these where a patient hemorrhaged or developed an infection of a prior cyst, but it's usually concerning for malignancy. So when I look at a CT, what we do is when we look at the CT of that cyst, we can use something called the Bosniak class classification to determine what grade complex cysts they have. And depending upon that, like if it's a 2F, I may follow up with them in about six months to a year. If it's anything grade three or above, that's more concerning. And those are ones that we actually should go in and we should do a nephrectomy and take that chunk of that complex cyst out. And just so that we don't have any risk of them developing renal cell carcinoma. So that's the kind of the big ways that I would usually identify them as CTs. And then again, depending upon that classification, the Bosniak kind of determines our, our direction of what we're going to do. Now, you said it could lead to malignancy. Would that be like renal cell carcinoma? Exactly. So usually oftentimes renal cell carcinoma can kind of like hide itself in these complex renal cysts and give that kind of appearance. Right. And they can give things like flank pain. So sometimes people can come in with renal cell carcinoma, have flank pain, have hematuria. They can have hypertension. They can have a lot of these things. But when you get that renal ultrasound or you get that CT scan, you're going to see it usually in one kidney, okay. whereas polycystic kidney disease is both kidneys. Yeah. And these are huge cysts, multiple cysts, variable sizes, whereas kind of a complex renal cyst, it's usually one kidney and it's multiloculated, it's irregular, it's calcified, and it's very scary looking. That's great to know. Easy to kind of differ, like yeah, differentiate. Exactly. So now that we've identified the underlying cause, how do we manage the following complications of autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease? I'm going to give a couple and just kind of go through how you would manage them. Okay. So the first one would be hypertension and proteinuria. What would you do? So we kind of talked about this a little bit. So their mechanism behind hypertension is that they have excess renin angiotensin aldosterone system activity. So I'd start them on an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. So something like lisinopril, that would be a good drug as an ACE inhibitor or an ARB like Lazartam. The benefit of using these is that you're suppressing the angiotensin 2, right? So you're acting as an ACE inhibitor. You're inhibiting the conversion of a, uh, angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. That's going to lead to less vasoconstriction. That's going to lead to less ADH and aldosterone production, less water retention, sodium retention, and less blood volume retention. So that's going to be the benefit of that. The other nice thing of why ACE inhibitors and ARBs are great for not just hypertension, but in these patients, patients who have polycystic kidney disease, they end up with chronic kidney disease. So they damage their kidneys. They develop a glomerular sclerosis over the time. And that leads to them losing protein in the urine, especially albumin. When you lose albumin in the urine, your chances of the disease progressing gets worse. Yeah. And you develop a lot of complications due to albuminuria. So when we give ACE inhibitors or ARBs, they actually act at the efferent arterial. And when they act at the efferent arterial, they cause it to vasodilate, which then drops the intraglomerular blood pressure. And so more blood can kind of... Uh, it's easier for blood to leave the glomerulus. And so the pressure drops and we don't filter off as much albumin into the urine. So ACE inhibitors, ARBs, great for hypertension and great for proteinuria and preventing the progression of kidney disease. How about in patients who are in end-stage renal disease? How would you manage that? Yeah, this is a tough one because oftentimes with any patient who has CKD, you're managing it just like you would a CKD patient. It's just the etiology behind it's a little bit different, right? So you're still going to manage all the complications of CKD. So, for example, if they're developing hyperphosphatemia, you'll give them phosphate binders. If they're developing low vitamin D, you'll give them vitamin D. 
Um, if they have situations where they have anemia, you'll give them EPO based upon those standards. So you're treating all of those things as you would CKD. The difference of what we found, and this is where it's interesting, ADH has been shown to increase cystogenesis. So if I have more ADH in a patient who, let's say a 30-year-old, they're going to get more cysts. So, and this is pretty common because in patients who have uh, polycystic kidney disease, they have a hyperactive renin-angiotensin aldosterone system, so they make more ADH a lot. And then what happens is the ADH goes to the kidneys and tries to reabsorb water, but it goes into the cysts and makes it produce more water into the cysts. And those cysts get bigger and yep. bigger and bigger and compress more renal vasculature. So there is a drug that has been potentially shown to reduce the progression of chronic kidney disease, and that's called tolvaptan. It's an ADH antagonist. So you're blocking ADH at those cysts and reducing the size of the cyst. And if you reduce the size of them, theoretically, you can reduce the progression of the disease. The literature behind it has shown some degree of promise. You have to get them started early. Okay. They have to have a risk for progression of chronic kidney disease, like a rapid progression. And usually we look at their total uh, volume of their kidney size. And if their total volume kidney size is pretty big, we may be able to reduce that progression. So problem with this drug is that when you give an ADH antagonist, they piss a lot. <laughs> they piss a lot. So yeah. they, they're constantly peeing. And so they have excessive polyuria. And imagine trying to take this drug and go to bed at night and then yeah, having to yeah. pee a lot. Or you pee a lot, what do you want to do as a response to getting rid of a lot of water? You're going to drink. Yeah. And so they're drinking all the time, peeing all the time. And so that makes it a little bit of a tougher drug to tolerate. But it does have some degree of somewhat promise in reducing that progression. Otherwise, most of these patients, they'll progress. And unfortunately, they'll end up requiring dialysis. But these are patients, because of their age, they could benefit from, most likely from a renal transplant. Right. I mean, being 30 years old, that makes perfect sense. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. How about the, the last one? And pretty scary. The risk of the intracranial aneurysm. This is a tough one. And oftentimes the biggest thing is we may survey for these. And so let's say that the reason I would survey for these is a patient has a history of a family member who was diagnosed with an intracranial aneurysm or they had a family member die due to an aneurysm. So they, there's just a family history. We know that that exists. That puts the patient at high risk if they have polycystic kidney disease. So if you have a diagnosis and a family history of someone having an aneurysm or dying from an aneurysm, they're high risk and you can't miss that. And you want to make sure that it's see, do they have one? And so usually only in those circumstances, you'll get what's called an MRA. So a magnetic resonance angiography. It's an MRI. You light up the vessels and you look for any areas of where these aneurysms could be. If you find it, you need close surveillance. Is it getting bigger? If it is, or it's a decent size already, I'm going to reach out to neurosurgery or I'm going to reach out to interventional radiology and say, should we clip this to secure it to make sure it doesn't rupture? Or should we go in via interventional and coil it and secure it so that it doesn't rupture? So those are things that you have to consider. But the biggest thing is, when do I get an MRA? It's the diagnosis plus an underlying family history of someone having an aneurysm or dying from an aneurysm that puts them at high risk. And you don't want to miss that. That's pretty interesting. Um, and that's really all the questions I had for this case. Thanks, man. This was a pretty simple one. I think cystic yeah. kidney disease is one of those that a lot of the times patients will come to the hospital, they'll get a CT or an ultrasound for something else. They'll find a cyst and they'll say, oh, what do I do with this? Like simple, normal cyst. Nothing. Leave it alone. If it's complex, uh, it looks loculated, irregular. It's weird looking. I follow up with it if it's really scary or I reach out to surgery and say, hey, I think you need to do a nephrectomy and remove this piece. Yeah. If you see both kidneys really big, really enlarged, and they got on top of that hypertension, they're young, start thinking about polycystic kidney disease. And again, big things to watch out for these patients is in adrenal disease, watch out for that blood pressure, and make sure that you don't miss them having a potential subarachnoid hemorrhage because of an aneurysm that's brewing that you don't know of. And I think those are the big things to take away from this. I love it. Thank you for that. Yeah, man. Well, listeners, I hope that you guys enjoyed this podcast. I love you guys. I thank you guys. And as always, until next time.